when I look back, all my mistakes, all the bad things that happened to me, start with making a bad decision about who to associate yourself with, whether it was business or personal life. Man of Mastery, episode 53 with Marek Mislowski, author of Chasing Black Unicorns, the story of Silicon Valley meets Indiana Jones. Uh, Mark was really cool to talk to. He's a young, successful technology entrepreneur and really deep thinker, but a guy who takes action, sees opportunity, goes after it, thrives in the chaos. And in that, he shares about the excitement and the opportunity of, of business in Africa something I'm not that familiar with. And at the same time, he's got this story of facing extradition, being flagged as an international fugitive and looking at 21 years or so in a Nigerian prison. But the downfall really in, in that story and in his business doesn't have really much to do at all with, with Africa other than the corrupt system that allowed it to happen. It's really a story that a lot of us know all too well, which is not picking the right business partners, or you could apply that more broadly in life. So super cool talk with Mark. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. And the book is an amazing story as well. So let's get into it with Mark Mislowski. All right, Mark, welcome. Uh, really pleased to talk to you. Really excited. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Michael. Yeah, thanks for making time today. So we're going we're gonna to roll with video. We'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm in California. You're in... Uh, in Barcelona, That's we're right, a world apart, Barcelona. but we're all kind of one world um, together right now through through this crisis. So again, I appreciate you taking some time away from from all the, the craziness going on. Uh, excited to talk about a number of things with you. So um, a, a lot of the maybe topics are going to bounce off of, of your book that I just had the pleasure of reading. So you're the author of Chasing Black Unicorns. You're also quite quite known as uh, as a digital entrepreneur. So you you started up a company that I um, I think of as sort of the Expedia of, of Africa hotel bookings online, yeah. as well as the Amazon of Africa. So you get some amazing stories under your belt. Yeah, it's all kind of blended. So, uh, everything is on a much much smaller scale in Africa. And there were two companies. One is one was called the Expedia. The other one was called Amazon, and they at some point emerged. So you don't really know what it is in the end. <laughs> um, Un understood. But um, yeah, I think as, as I mentioned, sort of pre-roll, uh, it, it's it's really interesting to unpack success. You know, people see uh, hey, you've shown up in a collared shirt today. I'm in my typical uh, Spartan type uh, T-shirt, <laughs> but um, you know, people see the the mark that's uh, that's on TED Talk. Uh, or the face of the companies that you've started, or um, yeah. I, I think you, you know, you're still with the uh, sort of supermodel uh, <laughs> partner, right? But it, it's really interesting to unpack the, the yeah. sort of the stories behind the success and uh, the pe where people yeah. came from and kind of the dark days that lead to the bright days that people really see. So uh, we've got a lot to talk about, but maybe just a few minutes on sort of your background where, you know, growing up yeah. and uh, what that looked like. So let me just give you and to your audience like a three minute version of my life really. Mm. Um, I born and raised in, uh, in Poland in the late 80s. So it was just before the communism collapsed. So I was raised in a very classic family. My father was a soldier. My mom was a teacher. In very humble beginnings. I, ne I was never hungry. Now I'm more hungry than I used to be because I'm, you know, <laughs> doing intermittent fasting. I was never hungry back then. They gave me good education, but that's it. I always wanted to get out of my small city because I was able to, you know, watch MTV and CNN and see the big world. That was always my driver. Moved to a bigger city to the university, had no clue what I want to do in my life. My mom told me to be a teacher of physics because that's a stable work. That's for them was stability, you know, working for the government in some way. Um, obviously, after first year, I quickly uh, dropped out of high school. I fell in love with business. Those were the early 2000s, the golden age for financial markets in Poland. I joined a company like there was like I was the employee number five. Three years after, there was like 3,000 of us. I made my first big money there. I thought I'm the king of the world. But quickly after that, burnout came, depression came, and also crisis came. And my bank account still had eight zeros, but it was on the minus side. Hmm? Um, so my second attempt to 
get back was in the startup world. European Union had uh, a lot of money to give to technology companies and I was lucky to get that money. And uh, among other failures, I was able to build one very interesting startup as a marketplace in a funeral business, another crazy business for me to choose. And that was a great adventure for me and my beginning of my African adventure, really, because I had to build an online business in a sector where the average age of an entrepreneur was 60 years old. And I had to really educate them about online business to do it with me. And that experience really prepared me to launch then e-commerce business and online travel business in Nigeria and then Kenya and, and other countries. Um, the way I moved to Africa is that I met Rocket Internet owners outside you. Uh, so in the U.S., it's not that known, that company. Um, but, you know, after Amazon and Alibaba, I think they're one of the biggest e-commerce groups in the world. And at that time, that was 2012, they were getting ready to, to really make it big in Africa, to build the booking.com version of Africa, the Amazon, the Uber, the Delivery Hero, the OLX, the Gumtree, you name it. And uh, they basically knew what they want to build there. They had the money. They were looking for managers to become their founders. And I got an offer I couldn't refuse. This is your, you know, ticket to a great adventure. I was paid almost nothing, but I was promised in the contract that if I deliver the results, I'm going to earn my shares like it is. And uh, there was a lot of adventures in between. Uh, most interesting part of my life ever. And about four years after, uh, the company went public on New York Stock Exchange. And one of the best adventures of my life, both, both business-wise and, and personal-wise. Uh, then from that amazing positive adventure, I got into the worst trouble of my life. <laughs> I opened a software company with uh, partners in Nigeria because everyone tells you you have a local partner because they will protect you. No one tells you that sometimes local partner is the bad guy. Um, and at some point, long story short, I, there was an attempt to kick me out of the company. Mm, there was an offer, just give us back your shares. We don't need you anymore to run this company. I said, never. Don't underestimate how stubborn a Polish guy can be. <laughs> and I decided to fight this in court. Um, I had to fight with corrupt Nigerian police and a lot of bad guys. But uh, after two years of fight, I'm the first and hopefully last foreigner in the history of Nigerian justice system that took the Nigerian police to court and won <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and even won some money, uh, as crazy as it sounds. And in the process, I was also wanted by the Interpol because Nigerian police decided to go after me for doing that to them. And they put me into the international list. And that's where I realized that my book can be very interesting <laughs> if I put everything in paper. Yeah, uh, you were yeah. definitely the, the first guest on the show who had a, uh, has had an Interpol red flag, which is reserved for terrorists, drug lords, murderers. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, you were facing extradition potentially from your own country to up to 21 yeah. years in, a, in a, an African prison in Nigeria. Yeah, that's true. That, that's actually also one funny thing is that Nigeria law is very delicate when it comes to you know frauds up to two hundred thousand dollars and it's like you maybe go to a jail for one year but if someone accuses you of anything above two hundred thousand dollars then you can go to jail up to 21 years and obviously in this arrest warrant someone uh, a witness said that i actually have stolen two hundred thousand dollars and one <laughs> that's so, uh, that's, so that's a, quite a step jump from uh from one year to 21 years i'm not sure i want to do even one year in a in a nigerian prison you know my um so most of my family background is irish and and largely italian but there on my mom's italian side there is some uh there's some czech and there's some polish Maybe that's where oh, some nice. of my stubbornness comes from. I, I've actually had a, a similar Definitely. experience of helping start a company uh, with a couple other business partners and then being invited to leave my own company. Uh, this is quite a feeling. I mean, it happens a lot and it can also be done in a normal civilized way. Uh, I consider conflicts in the board as something natural. Many companies thrive on conflict. Uh, you know, great ideas are born out of conflict and my other business partners had all the right to kick me out of the board and I had all the right to kick them out of the board as long as we are, you know, making those actions according to the letter of the law, you know, overthrowing you by, by, by votes, et cetera, et cetera, but not by, you know, <laughs> corrupting police. So we really have to keep it uh, civil. You know? Yeah, maybe different rules in different places, but I'm, I'm with you. You know, w one of the thing that you said in there that's really interesting is, is uh, and I appreciate you sharing the, you know, very humble, family background, because again, you see somebody who's, who's been very successful in business and you start to form perceptions uh, or maybe assumptions. But one thing you said in there was around your parents saying, hey, become a physics professor. There's stability 
in having yeah. a salary. There's stability in having yeah. a job. Well, hey, we're all in the middle of this COVID lockdown right now. And I think people are getting maybe a good education that the perceived stability of a, of a, of a paycheck, of a corporation Nothing. may not be a real yeah. thing. That is correct. And that's if we jump to this topic, I think this is one of the most positive things that we can get out of COVID in the long term is that it changes the paradigm of thinking. Uh, you, you know, you can't say I'm going to go into travel business because everyone loves to travel. And the moment everyone has money, they want to travel. You can't go into food business and say people will always be hungry <laughs> because it can really be uh, totally different than you uh, than, than you thought it is. So, yeah, yeah I agree here. Um, yeah, no. So it's, it's, it is a new world. Uh, hopefully we carry some really positive things forward, but there's always opportunity in this, right? Hey, you and I are speaking over Zoom. Zoom has had some huge ups and downs. As a, yeah. as a product of a, uh, of a tool that we can use to connect and do business. But I'm convinced that there will be new solutions that come out of this, uh, new ways of working, new ways of, of, uh, of, of inventiveness yeah. and, and uh, solutions. I mean, correct, yeah. Um, te from the technical point of view, we were supposed to have a go through a crisis anyway, because you, you can't have this bull, bull period for, for so long. It's been the longest bull period like since the 1920s. Um, what happens in crisis is that trends just accelerate. It's not like they suddenly change. Everything just accelerates, and and also businesses accelerate. You know, switching to remote work, video conferencing. I'm not even talking whether this is good or bad in the long term, but definitely it's a double-edged sword. Everything will happen faster. People will be fired faster. People will be hired faster. People will make sales faster. You can't be late five minutes anymore. You can't say that you've been stuck in traffic, <laughs> um, and, and so on. So. Um, yeah, I think I'm pretty positive in the in the long term. Uh, I also am not an expert, but this crisis, unlike many others, is really created by the governments. That's how I see it. I mean, it's them that told us to stop working. And the history will tell whether this was the best decision to go about it or not. Because there are countries which have done it in a different way. Check Sweden, for example. Um, and uh, we, we'll, we'll find out. But I think the stimulus plan and the stimulus packages to bring the economy back to life will be unprecedented uh, in this particular case. And I think this time, like ne like like never, people will be hungry to bring co come back to the you know proper lifestyle they they they, they, were, they had before. Remember, in the 1920, the Roaring Twenties after in the U.S. after First World War, they, people were so adventurous because they were so happy. You know, this is over. Uh, look at you know Second World War, where the whole Europe was absolutely destroyed. Uh, the Marshall Plan, the money that came from the U.S., everyone was so happy that, okay, we're going to rebuild it and we're going to be stronger than ever. And Europe has become stronger than ever after that. So capitalism has cycles. Um, if you're freaking out during this crisis, I think it's because it's your first crisis. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, like I told you, I've already lost all my money uh, in 2008 and I had to get out of it. And that's where all my paradigm thinking changed, changed and where I tried to, you know, not keep all the baskets, all the eggs in that one basket, etc. So, yeah. Um, you will never be able to run away from crisis. If this is your first one, embrace it. <laughs> embrace the grind. Embrace it. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, one of the recurring themes that uh, I'm really fascinated with and we talk about in this podcast is, uh, is growth through adversity and, uh, and, and preparing for things like this, right? You can, you can force yourself through man-made crucibles to start mm -hmm. to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, figure out what it looks like to go through many crises yeah before you have to face the big one. And, and when you face these bigger challenges in life, whether it's COVID, whether you have a health problem, you lose a job, whatever it might be, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna think about that? How are you gonna react to that? What's your mindset through something like that? So um, hey, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here, but take, take, me, through yeah, the, yeah. take me through the mindset of uh, going to an airport in Warsaw, your, uh, your, your home country, Poland, you're on your way to London, and suddenly yeah. you find yourself in a windowless room um, yeah. that as you describe it in the book, that first night in prison, countless panic attacks. And you mentioned some things that, that you did from a mindset and a physical perspective, attempting to meditate, uh, going back and forth, maybe between positive and, and weeping. You said you did a bunch of push-ups, praying to all the gods I could think of, walking around in circles, logging steps. <laughs> and you said, I was finally able to calm down and get my shit together. So tell, yeah. me, tell me what that looked like. Oh, it was an absolute catharsis. Um, exactly what, so at this time, I already knew what's, what's happening more or less because, you know, that, that conflict with my business partner was in stages. It was already after he tried to kick me out from the company. 
uh, and gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. Just give me back the company. This is your money, which was like, you know, a fraction of what the company was worth. And then I went and I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to kick you out of the board and I'm going to take over the company. And I did this because all other shareholders and all other board members supported me. So we were able to remove him the normal way. <laughs> and then I underestimated his ego. And then he went quiet and he was preparing this whole thing. And then I go to, I'm at the airport. I was flying to London. I was actually in Poland for Christmas and I was leaving Poland for after Christmas to London. And uh, I got stopped. They told me I'm apparently wanted by the government. No one has ever treated me with such respect as at this airport because I think that was the first time a, a Polish guy, a white guy, did something wrong in Nigeria. It's usually the other <laughs> way around. They were like, dude, what did you do there? Yeah. And uh, I already like, already locked down. So I went through, I think, four stages of grievance that you always go through when, when something like this happened. First, it was like I couldn't really believe it. And I was just shocked. I couldn't think. Um, the only thing I was afraid is that my girlfriend, you know, I won't see her again. Then I went into this huge rage of, oh my God, the moment I got out of it, I'm getting on the plane and I'm going to, you know, suffocate this guy with my bare hands. Like that's, I was just imagining and I'm going to fucking kill this guy. Um, and then you go into this stage of, oh my God, this is over. Like, what if they really extradite me to Nigeria? Because that's what they told me. You're going to, you're going to be now transported to Nigeria. And I knew what was going to happen in Nigeria. They're going to either fuck me up in the in jail, so I then sign any paper they will give me, or they will just show me things I don't want to ever see. Maybe they won't touch me. But, you know, still it's going to be a horrific experience. Uh, and I knew that in, in the end I'm going to fucking lose. Sorry for my French, <laughs> because every time I talk about it, I'm, 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 I'm getting it's emotional. All good. It's all good. And then the fourth stage... That, that, that was the first stage when you start crying and weeping and you like you just feel so helpless and that's where i reminded myself about all the gods i've ever learned you know from Hare krishna to buddha to uh, uh, to mohammed of course to the jesus etc <laughs> it was crazy and um and then like you said yeah i, I was i remember tony robbins because i used to you know listen to his audiobooks many many years ago he said like emotion come promotion so that started running around in circles making push-ups uh, obviously, then I reminded myself about breathing techniques, Wim Hof, and meditation, and, and that started started working. But at some point, I just started crying, and uh, and only after I started crying, everything, I felt this relief, and I fell asleep for a couple of minutes. And then I woke up, and I was like, okay, this is gone. Now let's start thinking. And I was essentially sitting on this bunk bed for a couple hours. I don't remember how long until the sun came up, and I was imagining in my head every possible scenario from the worst to the best what can happen the moment someone opens this door and only after i realized okay i couldn't come up with more possible scenarios i have a way to react to every scenario in my head there's literally nothing else i can do right now and that's where i felt this piece okay i'm ready for everything because i've already played in my head the worst scenario and the best scenario and i'm just ready what the what the feedback is going to be and um yeah that was amazing that was absolutely amazing exercise to to learn how to deal with this. And uh, I kept just repeating to myself, I mean, you, you know, personality is actually created in situations like this. You don't know how strong you are until someone really puts you uh, next to the wall. And, and I think there's, you couldn't find more literal um, definition of putting you against the wall than putting you in a cell. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. The, what, what I was picturing and thinking about a lot when I read that portion of the book was, uh, you know, you mentioned Tony Robbins, I mean, a lot of people who have studied and, and repackaged similar uh, things about the way our mind works, and our ability to either be driven by our thoughts or proactively control our thoughts and, and use them yeah. to manage our mental state and our physical state. You know, I think you described yeah. a little bit of almost being ways. physically paralyzed yeah. initially by the by the shock and then the overwhelming emotions and, and, and other feelings there. Um, so as I read it, I, I was breaking it down. Um, so you, you saw my bookshelf behind me. A couple, a couple of those books there are from uh, a coach that I have here in San Diego, who is uh, it's a big military town. He is an ex uh, U.S. Navy SEAL, and so yeah. you know this and other organizations like them have put a lot of time and research and money into understanding how to how to train. Uh, we, might, we might call it mental toughness, but these are really these are all tools we can use every day. And so um, one of the things he talks about is the big four of mental toughness. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, it's controlled breathing or, or, or understanding how to use right, breathing yeah. to regulate your body, uh, the, activating the parasympathetic nerve system. Um, micro goals, right? Breaking things down into manageable, yeah. manageable pieces. Not, t- not thinking about the 21 years ahead of you potentially in a Nigerian yeah. prison, but you, just know, small, yeah. you, you like to bike and run. It's, you know, sometimes it's like I just have to make it to that next mile or to yeah. that next street corner, to that next tree. Uh, visualization. And, you know, that, that can be something, as you say, like we're, our mind runs away from us and we just start visualizing all the worst scenarios and fear, or yeah. we can exercise those, get through them and then, and then, uh, use positive visualization. And then the, the fourth is explicitly, uh, positivity in our, you know, in our thoughts and, and what we're telling ourselves, uh, yeah. versus maybe other stories that, that we're making up. So it's, it's really interesting to see, um, a real world, real world experience where you somehow tapped into that brought these things together and, uh, and got yourself back yeah. and, and where you needed to be. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also came, came out so naturally, yeah. Just trying to, to, to tap into whatever knowledge you kind of got somewhere, somewhere else. Cause I would never think about all those things for the last five years and suddenly you need them and you remember them. And that was amazing. Yeah. Um, the, and the then, book, uh, yeah, just, just a quick question about the, the cover of the book. Uh, yeah. so it's, it's sort of an image of you, um with uh i don't know i don't know how to describe the shape or the geometry or the matrix um is, is that supposed to be sort of a mind-blowing image or what does the image of the book cover rec- represent so there was really not that much philosophy behind it i guess okay. i added it on top of it okay. <laughs> uh it's just half of my face and the other half is is a lion uh which is not really sh- you know the re- uh, drone uh in a classic way it's like a lion made out of those those uh lines which are supposed to um bring you no it needs to look modern and related to technology and future um so obviously the book is called chasing black unicorn so the action is happening in, in africa there's this lion related to africa i think the whole title is a mesh, mishmash of everything um don't ask me why it is this way it's my publisher saying you know the whole point for the book cover is that you have a attention span of, of five seconds when someone passes your book in the library or in a bookstore they look at it and they quickly decide whether to take it or not so uh, it's there's a lot of psychology behind it not too much sense to be honest <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough I, I have to go back and look at it again i didn't i didn't pick up on the lion it just looked like sort of uh your mind being blown and it, and it is kind of a mind-blowing story uh yeah. there's, there's lots of good stuff in there so we won't go through all of it hopefully people will uh will be excited and want to go read it themselves and learn more. Um, let's just back into a couple other things here, but the, sure. the book itself, uh, so you've written and, um, tell us about where the proceeds of the, the book are going, because this isn't, this isn't really your business. This is driving another passion project, right? Yeah. So that, that's also another story to give you a background because I, I knew that, so this why I wrote the book. Let me just tell you in the first place. Obviously, like every ambitious guy, I wanted to write a book at some point in my life. It used to be when I'm going to be 80 years and famous. Yeah, but <laughs> that didn't work. Um, then when I moved to, when I was moving to Africa, Nigeria to be precise, in 2012, um, I wanted literature because that's what I always do. I, I approach a problem and I try to collect all the available data uh, to learn from else's mistakes. And the only books I could find about Africa back then was you know, some professor of a university writes a very smart book, but it's very theoretical and nothing about, you know, running practical business. Or there's this crazy guy riding his motorbike from, you know, Cairo to Cape Town. And that's also a cool book, but no, not much value when you want to run a business there. So I figured, hmm, I need like a, you know, zero to one, like Peter Thiel, but the African version. <laughs> and I was like, maybe I'm onto something. Maybe my experience will be very specific because I will be running online businesses in Africa. So that's kind of stayed in my head. And then when this whole situation in, in, the, in the jail happened, that's when I told myself, okay, if you get out of this alive, this is actually going to be a great portion for your book because it's going to be a business book with some drama. <laughs> so it's going to make it interesting than just a business book. And, uh, and the, the, the thought that I had in my head that I can write a book about this as long as I, I have a nice happy end really kept me motivated throughout this you know, battle, which took me two years. Uh, and uh, a lot of other adventures in the in the meantime. And then, you know, I also wanted to write this book because although what happened to me, I don't want to be this guy that says Africa is bad, Nigeria is dangerous, don't go there. I want to be this guy that says, although what happened to me, when you summarize everything that happened to me, 
I still think that it's one of the most amazing regions to do business in because now I have the legitimacy to talk about it and I'm reliable because even though what happened to me, I'm doing it just like that. So this is why the book is, is, about, is there. And then I wanted to show that I didn't write the book to make money out of it. I just write the book to make a statement, share my story, etc. So I figured I need to show that all the money from the book sales and any speaking engagement that I'm getting, I will be pushing into a charity. And then, you know, I started looking for a charity I could choose as a, you know, investor, as a typical guy from the startup world. And I've realized that these companies, these organizations are managed the worst possible way. I mean, they're managed. It's just, uh, it's just your, your blood boils to see how ineffective they are, how old school they are, how they do not utilize the technology, how lack of transparency works in their favor because they're really not about fixing the problem. They're about keeping the problem alive so they can keep raising money, et cetera, et cetera. So I was like, if this can work, I need to launch my own charity. It's not gonna be a big one, but actually a good thing because the smaller the charity, the more effective it is, the more transparent, uh, the less people are involved, the less people potentially can steal from you and so on and so on. So I was like, damn it, let's do it on my, myself. And uh, not really myself because then my girlfriend stepped in and she said, oh, you want this charity? So this is what you have to do. So we ended up, you know, helping only females and orphan girls, et cetera. There, there's a bigger, a bigger story behind it. I don't want to now get into details, but that was the, the, the whole line of thinking that ended up at, you know, launching on charity, which was like uh, so early in my life than I ever thought it's going to happen. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how you just go out and, and see opportunities and problems and just go knock them down. And, and I, you know, even in the U S where, there, there's a legal requirement for nonprofits to file disclosure and financials. I mean, who, who, who often goes and looks at those, right? And uh, yeah. nonprofit doesn't mean that you don't have executives that are very, very well paid, salaries. Yeah. right? Yeah. Huge salaries in some cases and, um, and just a, a sick percentage of the donations going to what we'll call operating costs as opposed to, to the actual yeah. cause. So yeah. I, I really admire that you're uh, you know, you're doing something yourself to take action, to, to make a, yeah. a bit of a difference. And I think it's great that people realize that if they're interested in this story, which is fascinating, that the book itself is, is benefiting, you know, something in the real, real world. Tell me, um, so you, 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 you've been a serial technology or digital entrepreneur, but uh, I was also interested to learn a point you made in the book. Um, looking at a quote here I have again, where you, you, you mentioned, you, you say you have a slight allergy to Excel, Excel and you don't necessarily, <laughs> yeah, Microsoft Excel, and you don't necessarily possess the greatest focus on details. You do say if there's one thing that you do well, it's build a team, motivate them, sell a vision and introduce energy yeah. into work. Yeah. I think a lot of times people look at tech startups and the founder is the, the strongest technology person, like a Zuckerberg or somebody else who might be a programmer behind a tech startup. So uh, this is encouraging for me to read. Tell me more about being a better leader and team builder behind a technology company. Yeah, uh, engineers, engineers in general make, make great companies because engineers, by definition, they love to search for patterns and rules, etc. And, uh, and especially building a, a long-lasting company, a, a big, great organization, which is efficient, is about finding those rules and making a machine that is as, uh, as indifferent to human mistake as possible. Um, but when you look at the stages of a company growth, um, there's really not too many cases when one founder was able to stay with this company until the pinnacle of this company. Zuckerberg and, and Bezos uh, are actually exceptions from the rule. Uh, what you really need in the beginning uh, is, is someone that can sell the vision to other people that will stick uh, you know, through the bad times of the company because the, in the beginning, everything is, just doesn't work. Uh, so you need to be a great, I would call it human glue, really. So someone that's, that can build a team and make sure, you know, make, make sure that they, they do follow you and, and build this company together. And the early stage of company growth, no task is given to you. You have to come up with everything. Um, you're the one that is driving the growth. When you're a manager at the company, at the second, other type of growth, you know, uh, later stage, it's all about really dissecting what is coming to you and deciding what is important, what is not important. But you, you're basically waiting there what to what comes to you in most of the cases. Um, in, the, in the beginning, it's, it's totally different. And um, the old school approach to business and management was that you look at your personality types, you look at your skills, strengths and weaknesses, and you, you polish, you iron out those, those differences. You want to be like a machine that is good at everything. You want to be like a generalist. 
And I think that's not the case anymore. The, 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 the modern school of thought in business is that you want to focus on your strengths because you can really excel at them if you focus on making your strengths even stronger. And then you just have to fill your team with people that uh, fill out your, your, your weaknesses. Um, this is why CEOs many times change, like, you know, Sergey Brin or Larry Page from Google, at some point they moved to product from being the, you know, CEOs or et cetera, because that was their, their main skill and they had to replace uh, themselves. And, and I realized after I turned 30 and I'd done a lot of soul searching on bus in business and other things, is that I really thrive on, on the chaos part. I, I love the, 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 the the instability of the company at the early stage because I have this consultant mentality you know if I thought it's going to completely it's going to change with age I would always like to change places I live in I would like to change cars bikes gadgets girlfriend is something I don't change anymore uh, I hope she's my last and I and then I realized this is not this is not coming out with age this is type of personality like this hunter you would if, if you were living 2,000 years ago, you would be the guy that probably travels from forest to forest trying to hunt for animals. And in order to be happy in life and good in business, you have to find this type of job that really allows you to excel on your strengths. And that's, you can be either a consultant or a sales guy or a founder or a launcher. Uh, everywhere you can really take advantage of being able to thrive on chaos and uh, and like people and make them follow you, you know, listen to your story and so on. And for me, it was, it was the early stage of startups. This is why I would, you know, launch a company, be with it for three years, max. And then, you know, you grow to organization to more than 100 people and you realize that this is boring and you're looking for a new adventure. Unless you're staying in one company that allows you to search for new adventures all the time, maybe in different departments, you yeah. know. Yeah, that's, uh, I think those are, those are somewhat rare as well. I, I can relate. I, I mean, I, I've, I've been... Uh, on the startup side of things. And I, I've been in the consulting world a long time, which consulting, I think of, uh, maybe that's, that is a type of job. Uh, in a sense, it's lots of little jobs. Every project is a new challenge. Every project is like a new business. Uh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's chaos, either the chaos of starting or the chaos of transformation or reinvigorating a business. Um, so yeah, I'm one of those animals too. I don't, I don't do well in a very steady state operation where things get to me, frustratingly boring and repetitive and, and yeah. things start to feel like a waste of time. In fact, I think I've only had um, two jobs that were truly sort of operational uh, stage of, of a business and, and got fired from both of them yeah. for <laughs> creating too much yeah. friction, I think, in, uh, in really wanting to change and going against uh, maybe some culture there. I, I was just, as, as you were saying a couple of those things um, and talking about, you know, theory in, in business. Um, book I'm, I'm reading right now is written. Uh, it's called Discipline Entrepreneurship by Bill Olay, um, professor of uh, in the School of Entrepreneurs at uh, MIT. Um, and one of the things he stresses in the book early on, and I know this was the case when I went through my MBA, is the the importance of. Um, so you see some of these uh, high profile startup founders and CEOs who. Um, either did it on their own or maybe we perceive they did it on their own, but these guys, you know, now people are realizing the importance of, and I think this is some of the spirit of what you're getting to the importance of a team, right? We can yep. focus on our strengths and then put a team together of people who have complementary um, yep. strengths and, and skills, but man, that, that is so hard, right? You talk about hopefully your girlfriend is, is the, the last girlfriend. <laughs> people realize how challenging it is to find the right personal uh, partners, the, the relationship partners in life, but we yeah. don't always put the same emphasis on the chemistry in our, in our business partners. And, and, uh, in fact, it's interesting you mentioned Bezos because he pops up in your book as well. Um, that you mentioned that, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, another quote from the that book, age well. yeah. <laughs> wanted, wanted his woman to be able to get her man out of prison in some exotic country. I think your, yeah. uh, your girlfriend mentioned this when you guys finally, uh, finally reconnected, but that, that importance of, um, uh, look, there's a lot of lessons learned, I think, in, in some of the stuff you've yeah. been through. Um, how do, how do you look back on how you form business relationships, business partnerships, and how do you take that forward? Yeah. Oh man. When, when I look back, all my mistakes, all the bad things that happened to me, start with making a bad decision about who to associate yourself with, whether it was business or personal life. And uh, I realized that I was so bad at reading people, or I never appreciated how extremely important this is. And uh, now I'm a very strong believer that no one is perfect, but I do believe that perfect teams do exist. 
um, as long as you, I think Ray Dalio is, is the recent book that I re read, Principles. Is, is what, Ray Dalio is like one of those cool guys, such, an, such a successful guy in terms of analyzing trends and trying to quantify everything. Um, you can really quantify personality to, maybe you can't quantify everything, we're not robots, but there's so much you can really quantify and understand about our personalities. And as long as you do that, you are able to find people that will fit you. The, the science on that has really gone so, so far also in terms of business and analyzing other people. And um, I, I mean, this is so cheesy, but I couldn't stress it in any other way. It's all about the team. I mean, your girlfriend, your wife, or your partner, um, it's the person you're going to spend most of your life with. And this is the single most important factor that will whether either make you successful or, or a failure. So, um, yeah, you got to respect yourself and, and choose the right partner because um, otherwise you're going to fail at everything else. And, and same, same with business. Um, I've realized uh, that you got to choose the right person. And also what, is, what was very important for me is that I, I learned how to be humble. I was able to, you know, chase my demons for um, childhood. Uh, realize that my ego is a big factor. It's a double-edged sword. Many things which I went through in childhood really helped me in business. It's a very powerful thing to, to fuel yourself by your insecurities, but it can also destroy you totally. So you need to know how to manage that energy inside you. And, uh, and then, I, for example, for me, I had this journey of trying to really understand my ego. And for example, right now, I don't have a problem reporting to someone. I used to tell myself, if I ever build a business empire, it's my empire. But that was my favorite quote. Uh, it's not that case anymore because I, I found uh, jo enjoyment somewhere else. And I realized that uh, life is not about feeding the needs of the 15-year-old you. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. I, I think like the negative uh, energy can only take you so far. You know, what I, yeah. I think, I think, uh, put it in sports terms, I think about Lance Armstrong, who mm -hmm. rode as a very angry rider as a young man. And then after what he went through medically, uh, had a very different perspective, a different type of energy, a more positive energy that drove, drove him. Now, obviously, he had other issues with, with ego that, that drove other behaviors, uh, which is a whole, whole different story there. But I really like how you, you mentioned earlier, uh, the human glue to, uh, to teams. Um, there, and, and you love to quanti quantify stuff and take a scientific approach. So another book that's somewhere back on the shelf behind me here, if you haven't read it, is um, uh, Culture Code, Daniel Coyle. Um, okay, I'm going to write that. it down. How are you yeah, going to send me later? <laughs> I'll shoot it to you. Um, so I, I was amazed when I started into it how, uh, so they've got some amazing studies of how they can measure the, uh, I'll call it the chemistry uh, of mm -hmm. team dynamics and and it leads to ultimately leads to productivity i mean that's really what it's yeah. about as a team is producing results um, yeah. he actually starts the book with a with a fascinating case study where he's got teams of sort of mbas strategic consultant types and then he's got teams of like kindergartners or, or very young children and they're they're both tasked with solving the same problem and oh, really? the, and the <laughs> kids are much more effective at it because there's no ego there's no rank there's none of that social order that they're trying to factor into how to solve a problem. It's just go at it and kind of figure it out uh, wow. versus these other guys. And so uh, as a scientist, they were actually able to find some ways to measure these things, um, how tables are seated, how close people are sitting together, how quickly the back and forth is going in a conversation that reflects that dynamic. So I'll shoot you a link. It's, it's fascinating. Code. Okay. Okay. Sounds like something I would like. That's a good one. So let's, um, let's talk about one of your other passions. Obviously, uh, you see a lot of opportunity in, in the emerging markets of, of uh, Africa, and you seem to really have a love for some of the country and, and culture that you've experienced there, despite, um, you know, despite some of the, the, the other stuff. But um, yeah. yeah, tell me about, tell me about more about Nigeria. And I think you've also spent a good bit of time in South Africa, Cape Town in particular. Uh, so for people who maybe haven't been to Africa at all um, or certainly haven't done business in Africa. Tell, tell me about all the great stuff there. Yeah. So it's such an underestimated continent. We learn nothing about it in school. I learned in high school that, you know, some British and French assholes colonized this continent and did some many bad things and they decided then to leave and decolonize and the decolonization made it even worse. And <laughs> that's all I learned. 
Um, you got to remember that you're talking about a continent of 1 billion people, 50, 54 countries, but these countries really mean, mean nothing because they are artificial created 100 years ago. The real countries are the tribes and you have thousands of tribes and languages. You know, just in South Africa, I think you have 11 or 10 uh, official languages, I don't remember now. That shows you the versatility and the size. You can put in China, USA, and many European countries inside Africa in terms of size, uh, because the, map, the, the classic map we use doesn't show the right proportions. I fly from West Coast to, uh, to East Coast seven hours. So it, it's, really, it's really a big continent. And uh, what's cool, you know, remember I come from Poland, so we had this huge transformation when the communism collapsed. And I could see huge fortunes being made, but I was too young to be a part of it. My father was a soldier, so he was not really into business, and I was too young. And I could see people, you know, parents of my friends, you know, his parents would be like no one. And then he went into business. And then five years after, he's, he has this huge empire. So it's really good to hire kids that had rich friends because these kids have motivation. <laughs> so I was one of those kids that really wanted to make something. And when I arrived in Nigeria and I realized the transformation these countries are going through, I was like, man, this is like Poland in the 90s, just 10 times bigger. Uh, and then when you come from a more economically advanced country, you just see opportunities at every corner, just because you're like, okay, I feel like ordering some food, but wait a second, there's no restaurant that delivers, you know, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so you feel like you have a third eye. Uh, that also has a lot of, you know, risks because the, the, the challenges you're gonna meet in Nigeria are nothing like the challenges you're gonna meet in Europe. We've built an e-commerce business, but you know, our biggest challenge was logistics because there was no DHL. We had to build our own logistics network. There was no warehouses you could order books from or laptops. You had to import them from China directly because no one else would do it for you. So we had to solve a lot of problems of infrastructure that normally you take for granted in, in a more advanced market. And that adventure, that chaos was just, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's addictive. Lagos in Nigeria is like New York on cocaine, I'm telling you. <laughs> it, it's, it's a love and hate relationship. And that's where the chaos comes with, that love to chaos. In Europe, you know, I could build another mobile application that figures out how to steal time of millennials that, you know, take credit cards of their parents. But there, back then, I don't know if this is called, if this is, um, if this is very naive to think it like this, but many people I hired back then, now they left my company, they opened their own companies, they got funding from, from investors, and I got messages from them, man, if it wasn't for you, you I would, well, my career would never go into technology that now gives me you know, career chances, etc. So it kind of makes you feel good um, on, on top of it. Uh, and you can see tangible results of your work. Uh, and I love that. Yeah, that's amazing. If you, um, and, and kudos for that, what, when you think about, uh, I mean, that is the third eye um, idea is, is, is sort of interesting. So uh, when I read that in the book, I guess two, two things I thought of there were that you have an opportunity to take, you don't have to reinvent something or invent something brand new, yeah. which there's a lot of risk to that, right? So you might take something that's been proven out as a model somewhere else and improve upon it, or maybe you apply it in a new place or in a new way, such as maybe in Africa. Yeah. But at the same time that we're talking about a, a technology driven business or supported business and, and you mentioned uh, warehousing and, and transportation yeah. delivery, things like that, you're going to hit, you're going to hit these challenges. So um, I mean, one of these is, is just communication and connectivity. Does, um, does 5G rollout have a place to opportunity in Africa? Now you're not going to like it, but the internet connection and quality in Lagos is better than San Francisco. All right. I'm serious. Uh, uh, inter so Africa is an extremely urbanized continent. Most of the people live in the big cities, like Lagos, 20 million people, Cairo, 20 million people. And, but then you leave the city and there's nothing. Yeah, No roads, no mm. power, no electricity, nothing. So everyone really is pulled into the city. And it actually helps technology businesses to grow because you have so many clients at, at, at a you know, uh, very small size of a, of a, of a city. Of a, uh, you know what I mean? The, the units, square units, square, square meters, square kilometers. Density. Density, yes. And, and that's, so the cities are really pushed forward and they slowly start to look like, uh, like, you know, many cities in the, at least more developed countries. Like, you know, Mexico City has, is not that much different from Cairo. Um, and probably some people will now, you know, say yeah, this is bullshit, but I'm, I, I'm happy to argue that. Um, so it's, it's, it's doing amazing well. And uh, as long as you have technology access, people have internet connectivity, 
Um, and as long as they have purchasing power, you can start building businesses on top of it. But you gotta be really careful. Uh, you know, Nigeria is the biggest or the second business economy in the world, in the Africa, depending on how you count it. Uh, there's 200 million people. But then when you look at how the money is redistributed, only 2 million people, which is 1%, make more than $10,000 per year. Hmm. So it, this is like, you have to make at least $900 per month to even think about this guy being a client of a cinema, of clothing, of you know any, any services you should for granted in, in Europe. So in order to build scale on, on products which are not basic, like flour or rice or milk, um, you really got to you really got got to watch out because the market is not as big as you would think. Uh, first, looking at those macroeconomics, you really need to go deeper. Uh, there was when we when we launched in two thousand twelve, there was this. You know, I wrote this about this in the book. This big consulting company did this research, like how many people have access to the internet and how many people people access, have access to Facebook, and the results were more people use Facebook than the internet. And we thought, like, this is bullshit. What's wrong here? And it actually showed that it wasn't bullshit. People did not know what else can you do on the internet besides Facebook or, or WhatsApp. So there's a lot of education to be done for people to understand that, okay, you can actually, you know, buy something online, a book a bus ticket, whatever. Um, Nigeria is the one of the few countries in the world when you can see Google ads on the TV before the main news, you know, program or before the main movie. You can see Google is showing, hey, do you know that there's this website called google.com and you can search for stuff online like when, when you want to search for stuff. So in how many countries in the world you have to promote Google search as a service? Yeah? So you, you got to be very careful because uh, Africa teaches you how to be humble. doesn't matter how rich you are. doesn't matter how successful your business was in other continents. I've seen multi-corporations coming to us or Europe thinking they have billions of dollars investing and they failed because they didn't underestimate, they underestimated the peculiarities of the local uh, market. You can copy the business model, but everything else you have to figure out on your own. Yeah, there's, there's so much in there. Uh, yeah, so not to throw PwC under the, under the bus, but it, I think it was PwC in your book <laughs> you mentioned as a consultant that, that came in and had the, the top-down numbers completely wrong. Uh, not only wrong, but then uh, yeah. you also make the point of how to apply them uh, to the particular local local economy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I see it as a consultant. A lot of times, people want they already know the answer, and somehow they want this validation of a, of a third party, or maybe investors require it, or something like that. But you got to be really careful about getting the right the right expertise that you might bring in as the as a third party. Um, I know we've only got a, f a few minutes left, Mark. Um, let's uh, let's talk about what's next for you. What's your next project? What's exciting on your on your horizon? Yeah, so uh, as I've already mentioned, I had very very strange two years of my life. I've turned, I've turned, you know, thirty. And the, the whole my process of trying to understand myself better started. I had to fight for my freedom in courts. I wrote a book. That wasn't the best time to run business, and um, and I was all, I needed a break. I needed to recharge my batteries after all that drama. I came I, I came out of. I published my book in Poland. Recently, he published this in the U.S. So recently, I was busy with some you know speaking engagement conferences, book openings, book launches. It's all super cool, but at some point, you want to go back to business because this is in my blood. Um, and I'm definitely ready to go back into business again. I know I'm not an advisor type of guy. I'm not an investor type of guy. All my investments I've done, besides two maybe, went bust because I invested in those guys just because I like them. And I thought, this is a company I would like to run on my own. That's the wrong investment thesis. So I realized I'm an entrepreneur guy. I want to be there in the field, in the trenches. Um, what I have promised myself is uh, whatever I get myself involved in, it's going to be a 10-year adventure because I need to make that break. I need to find myself a business where I'm going to somehow manage my need of changing things around but I want to do it inside one company because if I want to build something big, I mean, it has to be a decade. You can't build anything significantly big in three years. I mean, even Facebook, I mean, it's, you know, Zuckerberg has been building this stuff for years. Um, so this is the thing for me. And I think I'm going to do something in the renewables. Um, I look at the mega trends and I like solar energy more and more. There's this nice company from Sweden I've invested in recently that wants to build a global competition for Tesla roofs. And I think they have a nice chance to do it. And that sounds super exciting. Um, and I also like to write. I like the 
I like the process. I like the being in the flow where thinking about something is, is really not much less painful than writing this stuff. When you get that, when you train your mind and you can write down what you thought about, because that's usually the problem of writing, then cool stuff happen out of it. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking about writing another book. Um, not like a pressure. I just like the process of writing things down. Because also when I wrote my first book, I realized that the biggest lesson out of this book was for myself, because I was able to look at everything that happened to me from hindsight. Uh, so even if this book was written just to keep it in the bookshop, in my personal you know, closet, it still gave me, uh, gave me a lot. So yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's the terrifying thing that I have to get myself involved in a business that I know I have to stick in for 10 years because otherwise I will break a promise to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love how you, you kind of, you know, you get so much introspection and then you look at these things that maybe scare you a bit and you just run right towards them. You know, you're saying yeah. how scary maybe a 10 year uh, investment of your energy and your time might be and, and going after another book. I mean, these are, you, you make it sound easy, but these are big, tough things. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, what, so I, I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about passion for, um, for health and, um, Biohacking is probably the wrong word, but uh, kind of yeah. optimizing the human body as, as well as the mind. Uh, we mentioned uh, offline Ben Greenfield and, and his boundless uh, sort of Bible for, for exactly that kind of human health. Um, you mentioned intermittent fasting. Uh, so you, you also seem to me a little bit like a guy who doesn't mind a kick in the ass. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to throw something at you with, with um, all with love and positivity and, and all that behind it. I, I pulled up a couple of your, um, your images off the website and, and I think Ted talks. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I, I'm Mark, I'm seeing the buttons on the, on the shirt get a little tight. So I'm, I'm going to throw down the challenge for you to, to see what we can do on the physical realm uh, here in the next. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. That's that, that is true. But you know, the thing is which buttons are trying to pop out the ones on the top, I mean, this is not that bad, but when the buttons are on the bed, you want to pop. That's where the problem is. Uh, that's a good point. They were kind of more on the top. So maybe you're just working, <laughs> working the chest too much. Um, what else uh, in, in terms of, um, I, I know we're, we're probably closing here pretty quickly, but one of the things I wanted to hit, and I'm looking at, at the background of, uh, of where you're sitting in Barcelona today, you've made a lot of money, you've lost a lot of money. And I think um, part of what you've alluded to here is, is what's, what you learn about what's important in life. You know, you were driven yeah. maybe by financial success early on, and then we become driven by other things that are more meaningful and fulfilling. Um, you know, where, where do you stand on, on sort of materialism versus minimalism? I think you've said you don't own a car, you take Uber, you know, you kind of use yeah. these, these tools as opposed to maybe putting money into depreciating assets. So yeah. are, are you literally in an Airbnb? Like how do you, you know, what's your lifestyle like? Oh yeah, I've become an extreme minimalist, but let's be, let's be frank here. Um, it, I believe people that say they don't work for money after they've made their money. I believe people that say money doesn't give you happiness after they already have the money. Uh, you gotta have the money if you wanna be happy. It's probably not everything that you need in order to be happy, but this is an extreme important portion of it just to give you stability for that matter. I have really become a minimalist, uh, but I used to be, I used to be a fashion victim. I would have, you know, 10 different types of jackets for every type of, you know, day or occasion, etc. And I would have, I would switch cars and stuff like this. I would have a couple of watches. Uh, and then when I started traveling, <laughs> when I got my watch stolen for the first time, for the second time in Africa, when my luggage was lost, and I already started traveling a lot, mm, minimalism was kind of enforced on me uh, by being practical. So I started, you know, learning how to, you know, take less stuff with you and and uh, learning that you don't, you don't always have to have 10 shirts to choose from in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it was gradual. And then at some point I realized, and I also write about this in the book, I was, you know, at home and I could travel somewhere with my car for two weeks and I packed myself and I realized that it's still like one small bag because I really don't need more. And I started expanding this. And yeah, right now, I basically most of my most important belongings are in a, uh, in a luggage suitcase and a backpack. I'm really freaked. One thing that I really have a lot of is backpacks. I think I have like 10 different backpacks. And I always check on Kickstarter every time a new backpack comes out. I'm going to support them because I want to get it. So that's the only thing that I'm left with. I don't own a car anymore. I've always wanted to have a motorbike. Uh, so I recently got myself a, 
Harley Davidson. I took this photo ride twice and I'm like, okay, I just wanted to have a ride. I didn't want to own it, etc. So I really do not own anything right now, not in terms of moving stuff, um, houses. There's some land, but I don't even remember about this. We have two flat, three flats, one in South Africa, one in Spain, and one in Dominican Republic, but we're all renting them. For me, I'm afraid of renting, of buying something because you kind of, I look at it as a, okay, now I have to take care of it. What if something happens there? I'm going to have problems, etc. So yeah, I've realized that I'm really not spending much money on stuff. I do spend a lot of money on lifestyle. I mean, I travel a lot. I don't care. I mean, I always like to travel in comfort. And I definitely spend a lot of money on food quality, but it's still nothing if you don't spend money on clothes uh, or, mm, you know, all these things people come up with like cars because it's just such a waste of money. But anyway, not to talk about too long about it. Yeah, I I consider myself a minimalist, but for me, this is so natural. I only remind myself when people ask me and they like just, you know, go into shock when they look at. I'm traveling with someone for, for three weeks and they look at my luggage. Where's the rest of your luggage? And they look, at those, <laughs> look make those crazy eyes. And that's where I realized that the way I'm living is actually so much different than other people are living. But I never really I, I paid attention to it. It's like with, with, my, uh, with my first job, you know, in the financial sector. I remember my first salary. Everyone looked at me like I'm an alien. And I didn't really know that this is a good salary. But I was making like... 10 times more than everyone else, but I didn't know I'm good because I didn't have a benchmark. Um, so definitely I have become a minimalist, because, but I learned that I'm a minimalist after someone told me. <laughs> you know, that's oh, yeah, only in relativity. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think back sometimes to, I, so I took seven months uh, backpacking around the world um, almost 20 years ago. And actually Cape Town was one of my stops, beautiful, beautiful city. Um, yeah. But you know, y- you know, I, I, th- I think there's something about the human spirit that, that thrives on um, solving problems. And, and we, you know, we figure it out, we make it work, whatever it is. So, you know, I was backpacking around with, uh, I think, you know, a pair of boots, a pair of flip flops, um, you know, one, one pair of shorts that converted to pants and maybe like t- t- yeah. two t-shirts. And it's like, oh, you just amazing. make it work. Yeah. You find laundry, you, you, you buy a new t-shirt, get rid of the old one when you need it sort of thing. Exactly. Um, just have so, access to cash, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I love that you're, you know, you're putting the emphasis on, um, so you said sort of quality of food and then travel. I mean, these are experiential and they're health related. Yeah. Like the most and important I have things to, we can do. I have to admit here, for me, minimalism doesn't mean being like hard on the quality. Like I don't feel like backpacking or staying in a hostel. I want to stay in a nice hotel. I enjoy nature, but I enjoy watching nature on Discovery Channel, you know, <laughs> s- stuff like this. So that I don't really... And being minimalist doesn't mean being stingy, yeah? if, 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 or like super hardcore and, and like making being proud of how little money you spend. It's not about that. It's about spending yeah. what you feel like. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's more of a concentration or a maximization in the in the in the right areas or the areas that that you value. And hey, g- great health and experiencing great places and culture with with people are super super important things. And I I do agree with you that um, you know there are a lot of people who are. Uh, you know, we can go right back to the, the continent that you love. You know, a lot of people uh, live in, in poverty and in, in hunger, uh, lack of resources, things like that. So certainly making a living and being able to provide, it's Maslow's hierarchy, right? Um, yeah. So w- once you get to a place, and I do, I think there's in, immense value in making your money. I think there's a yeah. huge, you know, there are huge lessons in losing it <laughs> once you've made it. And then, and then also figuring out how to get back on your feet and make it back again. And then, and then ultimately what it, what it all means for you in life. So really appreciate you providing all that, that perspective. Uh, there's so much more in the, in the book and I know you've got a lot more to come. So, uh, I'm really going to encourage people. I'm going to put links in here to where to find your book, obviously on Amazon and other places, uh, and also links to what you have going on, but just quickly, where's, where's a great place to find you, uh, on the web and on, on social media. The the easiest website to pronounce is is chasingblackunicorns.com because all other websites have my Polish names, so it's too complicated. But if you go to chasingblackunicorns, just like my book title dot com, um, then you can find my social media handles, all the information about the book, my TED talks, um, the fund charity, the foundation, basically everything there. Everything is there if you want to catch up. If anyone listening here figure out okay maybe it makes sense to spend more time on checking this guy out then please do <laughs> all right fantastic i really appreciate you sharing the story and, and your time amazing stuff and look forward to, to seeing what's next from you yeah, it was a really nice talk thanks so much for the invite again 
My pleasure. All right, that was a fun one with Mark. I think you're really going to want to keep in touch. He's got big things yet to come. Stay in tune to him, and you can find all the links to Mark and his endeavors at manofmastery.com slash 053 for the show notes and links on this one. The books we talked about, and particularly Chasing Black Unicorns, check that one out, and also check out the foundation that he runs. All right, that's it for this week. Coming up next week, we're going to talk about empathy and post-traumatic growth.